when I really ask myself, you know, where exactly would I find the least difficult in terms of investing and holding on to outperformers, I would say one, these are areas that are within my circle of competence. And for me, I like consumer businesses because I find it easier to understand when a cosmetic brand is failing rather compared to like a chemical business, I don't know, in India is is struggling. I have have no idea if a company is struggling, but if it's a cosmetic business, I can speak to the consumers. They tell me, you know, I prefer this brand over another brand. And I find them easier to track their product relative to their competitors. Me and Day Day had a great conversation in the summer, and I still had so many questions left for him. So I brought him back on to continue the conversation on global outperformers, as well as to discuss some of the business that Jenga IP is invested in. To start off, I wanted to ask some questions specific to some interesting geographies. China showed some very interesting differences from some of the other countries you researched in terms of shareholder returns and earnings growth dislocations. When comparing China to the US, Japan, and India, it had a much lower shareholder return as a percentage of businesses that were compounding earnings greater than 20%. You mentioned three potential causes for this problem. One, state-owned enterprises and mixed-owned enterprises make up 40% of China's market cap. Two, Chinese companies rank relatively poorly on reporting standards. And three, the Chinese government can quickly alter regulatory environments on a whim, which can adversely affect profits in entire industries. So my question is, do you see the China discount closing anytime soon? Or do you think that this is something that investors will need to accept when they get exposure to Chinese businesses? Hi, Cal. Thanks for the question. I think as an investor, it's just, it's safer to expect the discount to always be there. And what that leaves a stock picker from an action view is rather than projecting 20 times earnings, you project 10 times earnings, then you just make sure the margin of of safety is much bigger in the investments you make in China. So, I mean, the three areas that we try to explore, so one of them being the fact that there are a lot more state-owned enterprises. Um, if you look at the top 10 largest companies in China, six out of 10 of them are state-owned. And if you compare that to India, it's four, and US is much less. So you have a lot more state-owned businesses, and most of them grow much slower. Um, there's a bit more they grow much slower from an earnings view. Their profit margins are not necessarily as high as the private businesses outside. So for example, I mean, and they grow much slower and the quality can sometimes be less. So, I mean, that's one of the big factors when you look at the banks in China, you look at Pingan and the other big firms, their, their potential for upside is much less. And that isn't just with China. I mean, it's pretty much throughout Asia because... If you look at each country, major, apart from India, majority of the largest companies tend to be the banks, utility businesses, energy businesses, and they just have a much lower growth profile. So from a compounding lens, lens they're, they're much tougher. From a reporting um, governance view, um, the what thing I would say is there's been a lot of improvement in China. I mean, one thing we have to put into perspective is that, you know, the U.S. market has had more than 100 years of existence, whereas with China, most of the businesses only went pub- um, public in the 19th. So they really only had 20 years. And investing is something that requires all parties involved. The investors have to have, you know, the knowledge base. Uh, the shareholders have to be able to, you know, they also have to have the knowledge base uh, that's required. So it needs all parties involved. And China has only been 20, 30 years in this, in terms of the development of a stock, ma- stock exchange. So there's been a lot of progress. Um, for the future, one thing I do see is that IFRS has kind of made investing from a global lens much easier. So you think about recent changes like, you know, IFRS 16 and how, you know, the Chinese accounting system standards have also incorporated, incorporated that into their own reporting. It becomes much easier to compare companies in different geographies. So, I mean, that's been, that's also been one of the big factors, I guess, with China. And I think it's, from an investor, it's one of the reasons to be, I guess, more a bit more optimistic going forward. Excellent. So Asia clearly has a good runway for growth. You mentioned that Asia's share of global GDP has grown from 26% 20 years ago to 34% 10 years ago to around 40% today. In the meantime, US and European shares of GDP have fallen over the last decade from 36 to 28% and 31% to 23% respectively. So for investors who are uninterested in China due to geopolitical risks and what you just discussed, what are some other countries that you see in Asia that are likely to produce outperformers in the coming decade? So 
there's a strong correlation with our performers when you look at the innovation, you look at the market size or so the consumer market, there's quite a bit of a strong correlation there. So in Europe, one of the most, well, pretty much the innovative countries like Germany, Sweden produced a lot more performers than the ones that are less innovative. And the ones that had big markets also did quite well. The UK has a big market, it did quite well. Sweden doesn't have a big market, but then they have very strong competence in exporting to big markets, so they did really well. So when I take that perspective in Europe and I apply it in Asia, again, I again focus on the big markets. So beyond China, the other big, two big markets, you know, you have India, you have Japan, you have South Korea. Now, one thing that not many people, I didn't realize until I did this study, is that there are a lot more companies listed in, in Asia than anywhere else. So while U.S. companies are much larger, and, you know, you have trillion dollar businesses in, in, in the U.S., in, in Asia, there are, much, there are a lot more companies. So Taiwan has a population of 26 million. And if you compare that with the U.K., it's 67 million. But then again, Taiwan has over 2,000 businesses listed. And it's way more than that. I think it's twice as much, yeah, almost twice as much companies are listed in Taiwan than listed in the U.S., if you compare South Korea and Germany, I mean, they're two really innovative countries, but then South Korea has four times as many listed businesses in Germany. And Germany's GDP is, for his, is more than double that of South Korea. So you can see that there's just so many businesses listed in South Korea. So while these countries would produce a lot of outperformers, remember, we have to look at the sample size. The sample size is just so big. So I think it's going to be very hard to go through all the companies in South Korea, for example, or trying to find, you know, the outperformers. So, I mean, one of the areas that we looked at was the turnover to outperformers. So the number of listed businesses that become outperformers. I think those are an area that a lot of Asian companies didn't do really well in. Now, the follow-up point is where I think they're going to be a, a high turnover to outperformers. And I think India... Although the market is quite expensive now, I think India will be somewhere I would focus on. Um, one, there's less, the private sector has a, plays a much stronger role in terms of business activity there. Two, there's a track record of outperformers there. Um, there's lots of growth potential. Um, they're benefiting from current geopolitics. So if they think about the amount of capital that's shifted from China to all, all the parts, India's been one of the beneficiaries there. You have a lot of public, strong businesses that are looking to set up, you know, operations in India and look into the Indian market. So you think about Apple now trying to have some of its manufacturing operations in India, that's going to benefit some local players. You think about the impact Amazon's having and it's driving innovation in retail segment in India. I think that's going to have a bit more impact than it's going to be some of performance there. So I'll also focus, I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time on India. The drawback for with India is that as a foreigner, it's you can't really invest in India. So you have to be an Indian national or you're, if you're a fund manager, you have to get you know, the license to be able to invest in India. So that's the drawback well, with investing there. And Japan, just to conclude, Japan is also quite good. But with Japan, I think it's much better to focus on areas where the Japanese economy has some competitiveness in. So one of the big facts with Japan is that it's an Asian population. And if you look at the outperformers there, you'll see quite a bit of businesses that are more skewed towards demand of an aging population. So you think about technology used in healthcare to make processes much simpler. You think about care homes, you think about services for care homes. Those are the things that we're outperforming in Japan. Um, so I'll focus on those areas where I think the Japanese economy has some form of global competitiveness. In. Excellent. So India is a country that I find very interesting for some of the reasons that you just outlined. And as your study shows, there are many outperformers that are coming out of India. And given the continued growth of the country in terms of GDP, I think there's a good chance it'll probably be at the top of your study if you did it again in 2032. However, India does have certain drawbacks, and I wanted to discuss them in a little more detail. Let's first start with the governance issues in India. What do foreign investors need to think about if they're able to actually invest there um, about governance in order to improve their competence in investing in India? I think one of the byproduct of having so much success so quickly is that it attracts so many potentially bad players. So when I think about this relative to in the stock market, I mean, if you look through 1992, when, you know, the stock market was really formed and organized well to today, there's just been so many success stories. Um, 
Success stories mean cases of companies going from one rupee per share to 10 rupee per share and then 100 rupee per share. Now, what that happens is that you're going to attract people who want to take advantage of the system. So they list bad companies or they just want to benefit from that super fast growth in stock exchange. And as a result, you've had certain frauds. We've had so many frauds in, in, the, in the stock market. Uh, from my personal experience in terms of looking at companies, there was a recent one with a company called Brightcom Group, and um, they're still listed, but there was just so much you know, inconsistency going on, fake bank accounts <laughs> being created by managers, and you know, the accounting was just not real. I mean, so many issues. And this is, a, this is not just India. This is emerging markets and companies that are trying to grow really quickly. This is what happens. Um, the one thing I would say is, in, in, in India and emerging markets, you have to place a lot more focus on quality. And what I mean by quality, not just, you know, quality from a business lens, also quality from the terms of when you assess management. You assess management, you assess the employees, and you assess, you know, its customers and the real relationship you have, the business has with its customers. You have to assess all those factors. And I mean, if you're investing in the U.S. and quality was probably, I mean, quality growth valuation, if quality was just 50% of, was 50, 50% of your, I guess, your investment process, in India and other emerging markets, I'll make quality maybe 75%. So you really need to place a lot more focus on that quality factor. And you really need to think about the business case. And if, um, if you have a business that produces coal and has software margins and is growing 50% each year, you really want to question where, how that, how that adds up. And, and it's really just asking those really basic questions. And, and I guess spending a bit more time on ground, trying to familiar, familiarize yourself with other shareholders and also with management and just really asking those questions, understanding the culture. Um, I think that's the way to overcome the governance issues um, in India. And do you think that regulators in India are trying to solve some of these governance issues through improved regulation? Like, what do you see in there? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a strong, I don't have a strong expertise on, re, on the regulatory view, um, regulatory aspect in India. But I mean, one thing I would say is that there's definitely been a lot more progress in terms of information, as a shareholder, in terms of the information companies need to put into their perspective. So I was looking at a few Indian companies earlier this year, and I was actually quite amazed by how much information they had shared about the business, their stores, the economics in their prospectus. And I'm, I'm guessing there was a bit of encouragement from a regulatory view there as well. And also when you have, you know, the, the mutual fund industry in India growing, um, the mutual funds in general have quite a bit of sophistication in terms of the questions they're going to ask management. Um, I think that also plays a regulatory view um, where your potential shareholders are of higher quality and going to ask you much more tougher questions. I think that's also going to play uh, a big role when you think about the level of reporting in India. But I mean, I'm guessing there's definitely been quite a bit of effort um, in this place. And also when you look at the penalties for fa um, false accounting or for you know reporting late or not reporting at all, I think India is definitely doing um, some work there. Excellent. So what are some of the specific value chains in India that you've been spending time researching and why do you think they offer upside in the future? So, I mean, before zooming into the value chain, I think it's really important to put where India is in perspective. So India is a country that has GDP per capita of about 2,500. 2,500 is really, really low. And um, if you look at, you know, S&P and, you know, Moody's and all the estimates out there. There's a lot of estimates on India being able to grow about 6 7% this year and for many years for the future. I mean, there's a big chance that India will be the third largest um, economy by the end of this decade. So you really need to put that into perspective. Um, and when you think about that, I kind of imagine myself, if I was in India, what would really be benefiting from that growth? And one of those big areas, I, I think, are the necessities, really. So you have a lot of households that don't have ACs, don't have refrigerators, you know, the basic amenities. And, I mean, you look at, like, I guess mainly the rural part. So you think about areas like the Hindi heartland, like Bihar, states like Bihar or Jharkhand or Uttar Pradesh. Those are cities where they're really going to benefit from, you know, this exponential growth with India and India's economy. And again, the value chain there for me is 
electronics, consumer electronics. Now, zooming more into consumer electronics, there's the manufacturers, producers, and then also the retailers. I'm a bit more interested in the retailers because with the manufacturers, there's a lot more competition as an Indian player. So there are still few, few Indian um, uh, manufacturers there, but I think there's a lot more competition. In the retail side, that requires a lot more on-ground expertise and is much more harder for... I mean, Amazon's got, Amazon's already in India, but when you think about expanding into the rural bits, it's a lot harder there just because of the logistics and you know the standard of living there. So I think that's a value chain that's um, going to benefit over the next few years. Um, the main player there, which is unlisted, is... Um, Reliance Digital, which is one of the, it's owned by one of the conglomerates in India, but there are a few smaller players there that are more regional in focus. And another thing about consumer electronics, if I, if outside India, I would never invest in electronics retail because it's failed for many years. I think it's going to keep failing for many years. When India, you have a state that has 200 million people and it's just one state. In, um, in Bihar, there's 130 million people. In Uttar Pradesh, I think, there's about 200 million people, if I'm not mistaken, but you have so many people in one state and 5% of them in Bihar, for example, don't have an AC. And this is a hot climate, you know, they don't have an AC. Maybe I think about 16% don't have refrigerators. I don't see why this couldn't grow up to 60%. So if that grows to 60% in 10 years time, you know, these regional players are where, you know, people in these states are going to buy ACs from. Yes, it's, you know, it's a one-off purchase, but... When you think about the number of the sheer number of households, I think it's a it's somewhere that has a lot of room for growth. Beyond electronics retail, I'm also looking at healthcare. So one of the learnings I learned in when I did this research was India is really the is really the hospital of the world. I mean, you think about the amount of APIs, active pharmaceutical integrants that, that are made in India, uh, it's just so big. So I think beyond just, you know, the generic drugs, they're going to move more into services. So quality hospitals, um, quality diagnostic centers, um, technology services, not many of them are listed, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the few years you see a lot more listed companies. One of the listed companies that I've been studying, Krishna Diagnostics, um, they're one of the players in this area. So I'm also studying that um, um, value chain and really trying to understand where exactly the potential for outperformance for the future there. And to conclude, there are chemicals and um, chemical divisions or chemical businesses have done really well in India because they've benefited from the increased outsourcing of, I don't know, like cosmetic products, for example. So India's done quite well there. If I haven't really looked into um, the chemicals from a value chain lens, but it's one of the projects I have for next year. Excellent. So in our previous interview, you mentioned that we could open the discussion on types of outperformers that you think are easiest to identify. So seeing as myself and many listeners in the audience are always on the lookout for potential multi-baggers, I thought we'd pick up where we left off during our last chat. Which type of outperformers do you think are the easiest to identify? I think, I think a better way to frame it is the least hard. <laughs> if, if outperformers were easy, oh my God, I'll have all the outperformers I could possibly think of, but it's, it's a very hard game. And um, one of the reasons why our performance is hard. It's not finding it. It's actually holding on to them. So you're, if you're going to hold on to a company for 10 years, like just think about the amount of times that stock is going to drop 25%, 30%. Are you going to have the stomach to actually go through all that volatility? Um, some of these companies are our performers. There were short reports written about them. I, I mean, now if a short report is written about a company on Twitter, everyone's going to say, yeah, I'm selling it. But do, are you going to have that stomach to really go through that volatility and do the research, understand the company so deeply that if someone tells you, yeah, they're doing fraud, you're going to say, no, I've done the research. I don't think they're doing fraud. I think it makes so much sense. I think it's an honest management. Are you going to have that stomach and that level of research? I think that's really the difficult part of investing in our performers. There's finding our performers and then there's investing in our performers. And there's no reward for finding them. There's a reward for investing them. So I think when I really ask myself, you know, where exactly can I, where, where exactly would I find the least difficult in terms of investing and holding on to our performers? I would say one is the areas that are within my circle of competence. And for me, I like consumer businesses because I find it easier to understand when a cosmetic brand is failing rather compared to like a chemical business, I don't know, in India is, is struggling. I have 
I have no idea if a chemical co company is struggling, but if it's a cosmetic business, I can speak to the consumers. They tell me, you know, I prefer this brand over another brand. Um, I think the shoe brand is doing much better. So I, I, I like co consumer businesses and I find them easier to track their product relative to their competitors. The other types of outperformers are areas where I think it's either a deeply oligopolistic market or there might even be natural monopolies. So a very good example of an outperformer from the book that we did a case study on, that I think I would have, I sh I, if I knew about them 10 years ago, I should have invested in was airports of Thailand. So Thailand, they have about 44 airports all owned by, or I think almost all owned by airports of Thailand. It's a listed company, went public, I think just after the financial crisis, and it was an outperformer between 2012 and 20, 2022. And if you think about the Thailand economy, it's done really well in medical tourism, number one. Um, number two, it's done really well in tourism. It's also done really well in tourism overall. It's grown really quickly. And then also, as an airport, as a business model, it's just a fantastic business model. When you think about the aeronautical revenue, like the, the airlines have to pay the airport you know, money every year. Um, for every trip they do. And then also there's the growing non, non aeronautical uh, revenue. So you think about the retail stores in the airport, that was something they really expanded on. Uh, um, they benefit from duty free revenues. That's, that's a business that I think has little to no competition. He has no competition from the aeronautical side, but then he has very little competition on the non aeronautical side. So I think that's something all of. I wish I'd, I knew about in 2012 as a business model. Another example in the US is, um, was a company called Texas Pacific Land Corporation. They, I mean, if you speak to the shareholders, they'll tell you they've had the worst management uh, of all time, but it's been an outperformer. The reason why it's been an outperformer is that they own eight, literally 880,000 acres of land in Texas. And all the big old companies pay them revenue each year. And that's growing year on year on year because Texas has become a lot more, in, um, a lot more important market in the oil when you think about what has happened with fracking and shale oil. So that's a business that it has no competitor on the land it owns. Uh, it, it's, a, it's really a target for the energy sector in Texas. And it's done really well. Um, it's had bad management, but still don't quite well. And, you know, when Warren Buffett says, I want to own businesses that even a bad management, you know, can bring this down. And then that's a really good example. I think that's a business that it has a 90, 90%, roughly 90% EBIT margin because it's zero on CapEx. So that's the type of business that I think uh, I would love to have owned as an outperformer. But yeah, just to conclude, uh, yes, there, it's, it's really having the stomach and having the level of research to hold a company during those volatile times or during the pandemic or during short reports, those sort of things. Uh, I think that's a real difficult bit with our performers. And you bring up a really good point there with the um, with finding monopolies. So when you looked back in time, say at that 2012 period, did, did a lot of these businesses that you just talked about, were they already monopolies or did they have to kind of establish themselves as time went on to becoming monopolies? So the two airports of Thailand, Texas, they've, they've always been monopolies. I mean, well, Texas isn't really, Texas specific isn't really a monopoly because you could do business in other areas of Texas, but where they're on the line is just so integral for oil and gas operations that you have to pay them, you know, some form of rent. And they also make money from using the water on the land. So that was something that they were able to also grow as an additional source of revenue over time. And then they can also sell some of the land and make money off that as well. So that was a monopoly in its own form, um, I would say. But not, I mean, again, not many of the of the um, of the outperformers were monopolies. Some of them had technical barriers to entry, um, and they were able to build on that, you know, that competitive advantage over time. But they're they're, they're quite difficult to really size up, especially when you look back in 2012. I mean, a very good example in the US, Nvidia, that was an outperformer. But then 2012, they were unprofitable. And there wasn't really clear signs that, you know, I mean, now you would say, yes, there are clear signs. It's an amazing AI company, you know. It, I, of course, I knew it was going to take over the world, but then they were unprofitable. There was actually a proper risk of bankruptcy. And it wasn't really clear that they were going to have, then they were mainly in gaming. I mean, this was before they expanded into auto and data centers. They were mainly gaming um, chips. So it wasn't really clear that, you know, they were really going to, you know, 
get that much head um, tailwinds all the time. That is too tough for me. So I, I, I wouldn't, I was, I wouldn't try and, you know, look for those type of businesses. I, I, I like things that look more easier. Now that I've learned more about your investing philosophy and read your study multiple times, I have a much better understanding of the types of businesses that you are looking for. Additionally, I've had a chance to look at many of the names in your portfolio. So for those in the audience who haven't gone down the rabbit hole as much as I have, can you let them know what the primary attributes are that you are looking for in potential investments? So I, I'm, I'm looking for, when I think about businesses, I break them down into quality, growth, value. And really, you're looking for businesses. The same thing Warren Buffett said. You're looking for businesses with good economics. That this is the growing, profitable return on capital. You're looking for second thing. You're looking for businesses with a competitive advantage. Um, so it might be high barriers to entry. Or the management might just have a very deep level of execution. High switching costs. Third, you're looking for things with owner-oriented management teams. So not necessarily founder-led businesses, but businesses where the management are really aligned with shareholders and they have a deep level of owner orientation. And then lastly, you're looking for businesses that have a margin of safety in terms of evaluation viewpoint. So I don't think that's rocket science. I think we're all looking for that. And but it's really having, one, it's having the level of energy to go through so many businesses and go really deeply in terms of the research to understand these things. Um, that's really what I'm trying to spend my time doing um, as an investor. So there are two names that I find interesting that are no longer in your portfolio, Process and Carew. Can you tell me a little bit about what your original thesis was on these names and what your reasoning was for exiting these positions? Mm. So when we, when we had Carew, then it was called Kartra. The core product is called Kartra. Uh, the Carew name is very strange because it has five O's, but I think it has its uh, place in South, South Africa that the founder had some affinity towards. So that's why he called it Carew with five O's. Uh, but when we when we invested in those companies, we were running a South African only strategy. So, for the listeners, I grew up in Nigeria, and I wanted to invest in Africa. I wanted to invest in somewhere in Africa because I thought you know this would be something that would be fun. But when I thought about the currency risk, um, there were really only two countries that I felt had a bit of a stable currency, which was Egypt and South Africa. And Egypt being an Arabic speaking country, I felt culturally it would just been too difficult for me. So we focused on just South Africa. So when I decided to focus on South Africa, I did an A to Z on the 180 plus listed companies and Karoo and Naspers. So we actually invested in Naspers, which is the parent company of Prozus, who owns shares in 10 cents. Complicated, but they, they initially stood out. So Karoo, Kartrak then, um, it's a fleet telematics business. So basically they build a hardware that you put in your car or your trucks. And there's also the subscription element or software element of it where they, you're able to track your vehicles, your cars over time. Um, there are lots of players in that, in that field. So there's also MIX telematics and there's some friend businesses as well. Where, but what CarTrack did was that they looked across the whole value chain. So when you think about a vehicle, if it's stolen, you can track the car, but then it doesn't stop it from being stolen. And when it's stolen, what then happens? So what CarTrack did was that they added an, another division, which was the recovery division. So basically when your truck is stolen, CarTrack had a team of people that would actually go into the field to actually try and recover it. And that division was very successful. So it had a 97% recovery rate. So when one of your customer's vehicle was actually stolen, um, it's if Cartrack sent someone, there was nine in ten chance, almost a hundred percent chance that was going to be recovered at some point. And again, you have to zoom out again with South Africa. South Africa, three. So if you look at the top ten cities with the highest crime rates, South Africa has three cities in there. So the crime rate in South Africa is quite high relative to Africa and also relative to the world. So it kind of made sense why the business that was trying to address something with crime rates was based in South Africa. The other thing I liked about car track was that they were expanding outside South Africa. So I think they're the largest players in West Africa as well. And a bit of the founding team were based in Singapore. So from a technology lens, they were quite, you know, globally minded in terms of they were trying to expand beyond just South Africa. So if the South African currency depreciated, um, the revenue that they were making that were in foreign currency would also do quite well. Um, so overall, it was a, bit, it was a good business. I mean, it earned a EBIT margin of 31, 32% each year. 
It had little to no debt on its balance sheet. It was growing about 15% each year. And when we bought our shares there, it was trading at about 17, 18 times P ratio. So you had a 15% grower, 30% EB margin, 30% return on capital. That was priced at 15 times. And I thought that was good value. And what happened was that the management got really fed up of the low valuations in South Africa. So they said they were going to delist in South Africa and then list in the U.S. as Karoo, which they have done. But when that happened, the share price just skyrocketed because everyone realized it was going to have a much higher valuation in the U.S. So it tripled in like a few weeks. And for me, I thought I felt the value was a bit too high. So it went up from 15 times to about 33 times. So we sold a stock. I think then it was about 60 rands per share and we had bought it for about 23 rands per share. Um, so we sold that and the valuation stayed a bit elevated. So we never really bought back in, but I think it's a good business. And it's one of the very few success stories of software coming from an African country doing well globally. I mean, they're not the market leader globally, but they've, they've done quite well expanding to other areas um, beyond just South Africa. And the other company was Naspers. So Naspers, I mean, the, the Naspers is the largest African company out there. But then it's not the largest because of its operations in Africa. It's the largest because of its investment in Tencent. So why I'm a global investor today was actually because of Naspers. Because when I was looking at Naspers and I was seeing them making investments in iFoods in Brazil, uh, in Melru in, in Russia, in Tencent in China, this was a team that was based in South Africa. But then they had a mindset of, we're going to, look at technology in other emerging markets that are like South Africa, because one, Silicon Valley has their own mindset of how technology should look like because they're based in the US, but then in the emerging market, because of the geography, because of the cost, um, consumer population, because of the GDP, it's going to be look a lot more different. So they literally, they literally went across all the BRICS countries and invested in, in e-commerce and um, technology-based businesses there. So the really successful one was Tencent. And I mean, they own about a third of Tencent. And I started learning about gaming sector and, you know, WeChat as well. And then 2019, if you look at Tencent, it was literally, literally a flawless business. And we bought a stake in Naspers and we held that up until we closed the fund. So focus on the global strategy in 2021. So that was the thesis uh, for Naspers. Excellent breakdowns. Thank you. So Evolution AB is a high quality business that is doing very well, growing top and bottom lines. But being in a subset of the iGaming market scares a lot of potential investors away due to the seemingly low barriers to entry. I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on Evolution's moat and how sustainable that you think it is. So I've, we've held Evolution since 2019 and it's been, I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity to learn a bit more about, you know, the iGaming industry. But one thing, I, one thing I would say I differ from most shareholders is that five years ago, Evolution was a company in the iGaming industry. Now today, given the size it's at, it's no longer just iGaming. It's really on certainty entertainment. That's what I, I call it. It's about a business that entertains its customers with the fact of uncertainty. Now, as a customer, I don't, I don't, I've never used anything evolution. I only found it about I gave me when I looked at the stock. But when you think about as a customer, as a consumer, where exactly can I be entertained by risk reward or uncertainty? There's the stock exchange, there's a the stock market, Robin Hood, and that's what people did in 2020, where they were literally just gambling on, you know, the stock market. There's crypto as well. So same thing happened there. There's sports betting. You think about DraftKings and, you know, I think ESPN is now expanding in there as well. And then also there's land-based casinos. So when you think about evolution gaming from uncertainty entertainment, you realize the market is actually really big. So does evolution have a moat in iGaming? Yes, it does. Does it have a moat in uncertainty management? And certain uncertainty entertainment? No, it doesn't. It's still far from a moat. So there's still a long way for evolution to come. I mean, the 20, I don't know, roughly $20 billion business in the US. It still has a long way to go to really build 
um, a moat um, in in its business, and it's doing well. Um, I mean, as a business with I don't know sixty plus percent AP margins, still growing twenty percent, although that growth rate has dropped from fifty percent four five years ago, it's still doing quite well. Still has strong solid market share in iGaming. Um, the acquisition of NetEnt when it tried to expand into RNG has not done as well. Um, but I still think there's room for improvements there. And of course, the valuations has dropped um, quite drastically over time. And now they've announced a buyback. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how they keep executing further. And the one thing I'll say about Evolution, I mean, among all the portfolio companies we own, when I look at execution from management, um, I will def- I'll probably rate um, Evolution probably the highest um, among them. Um, and... If you go back to the prospectus and you look at the things that were within the prospectus of what they were trying to achieve and what they've achieved today, it's just amazing. They've consistently consistently created new games, fine tuned new games, built studios all over all over the world in India and in so many different areas. They've expanded really well into the US as well, which not many people thought they were going to do. Then initially, when they when they went public, they were just in, in the EU. Um, they've done really well there. Um, so it's it's been phenomenal just saying the level of execution uh, that the team have done at Evolution. So I've heard many reasons why the market seems to dislike AB, which you kind of brought up here. So um, there's obviously been some issues with capital allocation that people don't like, um, and then the decreasing growth rates, which you mentioned. But I'd love to get a sense of why you think the market has been so stubborn with keeping the business's valuation so low, considering the quite obvious quality of the business. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask, what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. So I, I think Evolution has a good quality, but I don't think it has a strong mood. And because it doesn't have a strong mood, um, I don't think the valuation should be trading at, I don't know, 30 times or 40 times. I think 28 times, 27 times for me, I think that's something that's a bit more optimistic. Well, I think that's something that's, that makes sense for Evolution Gaming. Now, the problem is that three years ago, it was at 60 times earnings. And if you're expecting it to get back to 60 times earnings or 50 times earnings, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it should happen. And if it does happen again, I'll probably, I'll probably be a seller of the stock, so I think it'll be overvalued there. So I, I don't think it's trading from a multiples lens too far. I mean, I think now is about 20 times, 21 times um, forward earnings. I don't think it's too far from where it should be um, in trading. So you have a little multiple revaluation from 21 to 27, and then hopefully we're able to get 20% earnings growth over the next three to four years. Uh, I think to me, that's a good risk reward. I, I think it's, it's of good value. If the multiples drop to... 13 or 14 times, then I think the market's really being stubborn and really undervaluing where evolution should be trading. And I mean, management, I think they're starting to be, they're, they're quite aware of, you know, the valuation gap and, you know, they've announced a um, share buyback of about $400 million worth of shares. There's still the dividends there. Um, but whenever a company goes from high growth to just growth, the investors who want high growth leave the business, and then it takes time for those who want stable growth to learn about the business. And I think that's where Evolution is right now, where it's been growing 50% for the last, I don't know, 10, 20, 10 years. And then now it's in a place where it's no longer going to be growing 50 or 40 or even 30%, more probably going to be growing 25, 20 to 25%. So those investors interested in high, ultra fast growth companies no longer want evolution. And then people like me who, who want stable, you know, predictable, and I guess undervalued companies, 
we'll start getting a bit more interested. Um, so I think that's, that, that's happening with Evolution Gaming or Evolution AB. And the last thing is the fact that Evolution has quite a bit of revenue from unregulated market markets, so China and co. And it's, while now it's still revenue, you don't know how long that's going to last as revenue. And it's there's still a lot, a lot of uncertainty on what happens in those divisions for the future. I can say with a, with a high degree, a 95% degree of confidence that the revenue they're making from unregulated markets are going to be there in five years' time. So it's another area that I guess investors have to be aware of um, as a shareholder. So I also think that's why uh, the stock is at slightly lower multiples. Excellent. Thank you for that. So I noted a new addition to the Jenga IP portfolio, a Finnish company called GoFor. I'd love to ask you a few questions about this business. Uh, to start off, can you give a brief overview of what they do and who are their customers? Yeah, so go for, so b before we go to go for, I did a deep dive on the IT services industry, mainly because of global outperformers, because I always looked at consulting as a name, commodity, you know, wacky kind of business. But then when I did the study on global outperformers and I saw how many IT consulting we're not just doing well for them. They were actually profitable businesses. They were growing each year and actually benefiting from things like cloud computing and, you know, the, the big shift happening in the world in technology. It made me realize that there might be some IT consulting businesses that will be able to grow quite well in slightly in a predictable, recurring um, way. So I did that deep dive and I looked globally for businesses that might be able to achieve that going forward. And one of the ones I concluded on was GoFor. So GoFor, they're an IT consultant based in um, in Finland. And they started in 2004, originally by four co-founders, who I believe still own about 30% of the business. So they initially wanted to build software, but then their software business, I don't think it actually ever took off. But then they realized, if, we're not good, if, we, if you can't build a software business, this was after the um, financial, sorry, after the tech bubble in 2001, um, so they realized if, if you can't build a successful software business, would help other businesses, uh, you know, with their software. So they cover a range of ID consulting. So things like um, quality assurance, things like um, installation management, you know, restructuring of software, of web design, web, you know, arrangements, all sorts of things in ID consulting. They do quite a, bit, a broad range. And they originally focused on the public sector. So Finland is one of the most innovative countries in the world. And I think on some indexes, it's actually the most innovative country in the world. Uh, so from my thinking was that this is a country that if there's a new technology, the public sector are more likely to want to, you know, be enabled by that technology. And if they don't have the people to do it, they're going to look at IT consultants like GoFor to do it. And that's pretty much what they've been doing for some time. So initially it started off with a private public sector focus, but then after they got listed, they started expanding more into the private space and having private clients like Kone who do private clients and customers. And the business model is really by per hour basis. So they charge, you know, their, their customers on a time-based le um, lens. And then with the public sector, it's sometimes their contracts. So they will bid for a tender, and if the offering is attractive for their customers, so it might be, for example, Ministry of Transport in Finland, if they find their offering more attractive than the other competitors, they'll pick go for, which they did in earlier this year. And it's, it's, those contracts tend to be more long-term and more recurring um, in nature. So that's go for's model. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk more about the financials and um, why it's uh, what we thought it was attractive. Yeah, please. Feel free. Yeah. So with GoFor, I mean, they, when when I looked at them, they had compounded between so between twenty twelve. I think that's when the financials start. Twenty twelve and twenty twenty, they had compounded both revenue and profits by above thirty percent each year, and two thirds of that was organic growth, and a third of that was inorganic growth. So they started making acquisitions in two thousand seventeen. Uh, 2020, and this was mainly to expand uh, the expertise beyond Finland, so into Germany, and then also build expertise in private clients. So that's where they were mainly acquiring. 
And it's quite common for IT consultants to acquire smaller IT consulting businesses. It's, it's part of the strategy. That's what the big guys do, like Accenture and Tata Consulting. So GoFo had a good track record of growth. And I was trying to figure out why exactly do they have such a good growth track record and how long could that last for? So while I was learning about the business, um, I quite learned, I learned quite a bit about, you know, the culture of the team uh, at the management level and also at the employee level. So one of the things I like about GoFo is that there's just so much insight into the business. So one, they report their revenues monthly. So literally every month that uh, you can see the revenue data. So before the Q3 result comes out, um, you know what's happening already. You can have an idea about that. Then there's a GoFo blog where employees from GoFo write about you know, things they're experiencing in the business. So one of the cool things I, I learned about GoFo was that this was before Gen AI. So in 2017, they created their own internal chatbot to eliminate the need of middle management within GoFo. So GoFo have a very lean uh, mid office, very, very lean. I think it's like maybe 10, 20 people. And this is a business that has about 1,400 people. And that says a lot about the culture because they wanted to eliminate as, they wanted to free up as much time as possible that they could just focus doing, you know, productive things rather than billing. So it's common for IT consultants to spend so much time recording how many hours they spend on a project so they can, you know, bump, us, bump up the revenue they're going to collect from the customers. But they wanted to eliminate as much time as that. That was one of the things I liked about them. And then also I looked, you could also see the customer um, feedback reviews um, that public sectors had. And also, you would also notice that I think about 82% of its customers um, come back each year. So there's quite a high level of, you know, recurringness and stickiness from a customer base. And they, they win awards, both in terms of awards from a culture lens. So if you look at the NPS score, it's much higher than their local competitors. And also awards from the quality of the work they've done for, you know, at the Finnish government has also done quite well. And lastly, um, management have set, management set an internal target of growing revenues and profits 25% each year, uh, 15 to 25% each year. So 15% organic revenue, and then another 10% from inorganic revenue. This year, they've grown 27% organically alone. So they've, they've outperformed that 25% each year since they set that target in 2018. So they've done quite well. And I mean, when I look at the culture, I look at the, the customer feedback, I think, I think there's, there's an encouraging sign that things could still last quite a bit. The founders are still involved in the business, but they've scaled back a bit. So, so Kirk, who was the CEO, he's now the chairman of the board. And then the current CEO, he, was, he, started, he joined the business in 2010 and then became a CEO in 2019. Um, some of the other co-founders uh, are still, they still own about 30% entirely of the business, um, but they're still in the business in general. And lastly, on the valuation lens, it trades, it trades at about 17 times earnings. Yeah. And this is a business I think that can grow 25% each year. It has an EBIT margin of about 12, 12%, return on capital of 14%. That's at 17 times earnings. That's quite low relative to the international peers. So one of the other businesses in that space that I like, like listed in the US is Globant. Globant have a similar profitability, revenue, profit, growth rate, but then it's twice as expensive on the valuation lens. So I said three times forward ended. So if I can either buy one, and Tata Consulting is also quite good. Tata is even more profitable than, than go for, but then it's, it's slightly more expensive and it's growing much slower than go for. So. When you put that into perspective, I, I thought when, I, when we made the investment that go for would be a better pick um, than the alternatives there. So I noticed, I noticed in your study that you talked about IT consulting. And like you said, I find it very boring as well and didn't seem like it would be a, <laughs> a, a big uh, value creator, but clearly it is. Um, so in obviously you've done a lot of research on IT companies. What are, what are their competitive advantages over their competitors? Like, how are they able to maintain these high margins hmm. and grow at such high rates? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've learned to tie what is exciting to where I see the opportunities. So now I find IT consulting quite exciting because I think the opportunities there are kind of, they're okay. Um, they, they, they went quite high from a valuation lens when the pandemic happened. And quite a few of them have come down from a valuation lens, but I think it's still going to be attractive going forward. 
Now, with IT consulting, I think one thing you have to we have to realize as investors is that technology is changing, and the impact technology has is actually getting bigger. So, while I mean, some people would argue that the pace of technology has slowed down, but the impact new technology has on business has increased. So, just think about how many businesses have, have tried to get Gen AI on board within the space of, I don't know, six, seven months. It's much faster than how people bought TVs, I don't know, when TV was you know created. So the impact at which people want to um, add new technology to their business, to their livelihood, is so much quicker. Now, what that means is that if you don't have the brightest people in your company, it's going to be very hard to keep up with technology. Like if you're a healthcare business where majority of your, of your employees are healthcare practitioners, it's going to be very hard to know which level, which cloud computing provider I should use. Should I use Azure? Should I use AWS? How do I, you know, do quality testing and all these things? So because there's just so many options out there, so I can use any cloud provider, you know, the, the, the level of testing I need to do each year is so much more quicker, so much higher. That's where consulting comes into play because rather than trying to build your own IT team, which can be very expensive, it's something you can partner up with a company like GoFo or Tata Consulting, and you have a company that's solely dedicated to learning about technology and using their expertise as people to you know bring it into your business, and they're willing to be with you for many years. So even if an employee leaves in Tata, there'll be someone else that comes in tomorrow that'll be able to continue from where they stop. I think that value proposition makes a lot of sense for, I guess, for businesses that are not really exposed towards, you know, recruiting technology savvy people. So you think about, you know, construction and, you know, you just think about industries where it might be more public sector facing or there's less innovation in general. Um, I think IT consulting does a really good job there. So from a competitive advantage lens, so there, there are lots of areas to look at it from a competitive advantage. So one of the biggest ones is the people. So how quickly can you attract people? And that, the Indian companies, they have global domination there. So when you look at Tata Consulting, I mean, the universities in India, they're just incredible in terms of the number of talents they bring. And the companies there, Tata, Infosys, Wipro, they have an advantage of being able to recruit those people into their business much quicker than anyone else. Um, the Polish businesses also, the Eastern Europe businesses also build in some expertise there in terms of um, value for money in terms of being able to recruit. But that's one area um, in terms of competitive advantage. Another big area is really, I guess, the relationship with the client, um, the ratings, the feedback, the, the ease of working with them. That's much harder to gauge, but it's something that you can gain by speaking to their customers. So quite a few businesses would outsource their whole division to a IT consulting businesses. And it's public knowledge that they've outsourced that to IT consulting. And they just reach out to one or two people and ask them, you know, how's that relationship going? Um, how do you think Tata is responding, you know, working with them? How do you think GoFor is um, implementing those projects? So I think those are the two big areas um, that IT consulting have. The other thing is that, it's a, just to conclude, it's a low barrier to entry industry, but it's quite high barrier to success in the sense that being able to attract hundreds and thousands of people to work for your business is actually very hard as a, as a founder. You don't really see many IT consulting businesses created by just one founder. It's usually like a team of four or five people who left a, another IT consultant set up theirs. That's what happened with Go4. You know, that's what happened with a lot of these businesses. So it's actually quite a high barrier of success industry. And um, I think it's one that we're probably going to see a bit more outperformance going forward. But at the same time, uh, there, there, are, there are a lot of losers out there. So it's a, I'll say it's a stock pickers market where you really have to differentiate between the really good consulting businesses who actually produce value for money for their clients and the ones that just you know rely on their brand name and they just focus on their brand name to grow the business. Those ones will be cut out. And there's been quite a few bad examples of, of those type of businesses. Excellent. So one of the standout points for this business that you already pointed out was that um, they have about 4% of the public uh, market in um, in Finland and then 1% or so of the private market. Um, this means they have a ton of market share, obviously, left to go. 
Um, and that excludes international expansion, which you said they're already also working on. So what, what are your, um, what's your forecast for their growth into the future? Yeah. So the, my forecast, I think they'll, I think they're going to be able to achieve the 25% for the next three to four years. So that's in both revenue and EBIT and, and EBIT and profit. There isn't really room for, um, margin expansion with consulting because your cost are many people. You can't reduce, you shouldn't reduce the salary of people. So you can't really <laughs> expand by reducing salary or you don't have that much fixed cost. So the, the margins in IT consulting tend to be quite stable. And um, IT, um, GoFo have a policy. They have, they would, I think they're one of the first companies to create a collective agreement within IT consulting in Finland. And they try to increase the salaries about 4% each year. I think they increased about 4.5% last year. So that they try to keep that consistent. And you need to have a good culture to attract really talented people. So there's, there isn't going to be margin of expansion. But in terms of growth from a qualitative aspect, the one thing I would say is that Go for have they're probably going to make about two, they have, they've made about 186 million euros for the last 12 months, probably about 200 million by the end of this year. The uh, the Finnish IT consulting market is five billion, and you have a lot of foreign players. And one of the one of the big things, especially with the amount of deglobalization that we're seeing now, is that public sectors want to mock work. They want to mock. They want to work more with local players. So they. They are, look, that's one trend. And then also the big four consulting firms, so I think about EY, Deloitte, PwC, they have a lot of problems between audit and consulting. So a lot of clients are scaling back, using them for their consulting work and focusing on them for their audit work. So that created an opportunity for companies like um, GoFo, which are independent. They focus only on consulting and they're also domestic where they can expand into, you know, the Finland um, public sector space. So that's one, that's one big tailwind they have. Also, some of the competitors struggled um, in the past few years. Um, so there's Vincent, there's, there's some other local players in Finland. They've struggled a bit in terms of growth and go, from a cultural perspective, they've lost some employees. Um, that's something go has done quite well. So they have that tailwind as well. And then finally, in terms of growth, I don't think they'll ever have maybe 10% or 20% of the Finland growth market. So when they get to, I guess, when they, when they get to 500 million euros, which I think they might get that maybe in five, six years, I think we're going to see growth really slow down. Then you need another layer of growth. And that's what they've done with their expansion into, into Germany and the rest of the dark, re dark region, German speaking, Dutch regions, German speaking countries and Austria and co. So then right now, 12% of their revenue comes from that German, German speaking countries. And it's something that I think they're doing a really good job in. It's growing, it's doubling every two years in size. And they've acquired some really great businesses locally in Germany. So one is Imondo. I think they acquired that last year and that's done really well. They've made some previous um, um, acquisitions there. And uh, they're one of the few Finnish businesses that have actually done a good job expanding into Germany um, from a services lens. So I think that's another room. Also, the German market is 10 times bigger than Finland. So it's about a $50 billion market, IT consulting market. So it, there's a much, much larger term there. So if they can keep up what they're doing from recruiting, culture, winning new clients, both in private and public space, um, I think they'll be able to continue growing um, for, the, for the next three to four years. I think, I think the German region is going to be about 20% of total revenues by the end of next year. So that would be, that would, that would be interesting to see over the near term. Day Day, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience connect with you and learn more about Jenga IP and your research? Yeah, so our website is Jenga, J-E-N-G-A-I-P.com. Um, we share our research there. Uh, we try to keep our research open. Um, I love the feedback that I get from readers. So yeah, always feel free to reach out to me if you read one of our research and um, you have some questions. And I'm also on Twitter. My um, handle is Dede, D-E-D-E -D -E -E, underscore A-S-N, E-Y-E-S-A-N. So I'm on Twitter and also LinkedIn as well. And I'm always happy to talk about our research and what we're doing from a stock picking view. Excellent. EBITDA margin 68%, operating margin 63%, net margins of 58%, free cash flow margin 62%. I mean, that's 
it's hard to find businesses that, that can do that for a long period of time. And then on top of that, the thing that's really interesting is if, if you go back 10 years, all these margins have like doubled. It's insane how much more money this business is just making every single year. 